I hope that's better a little bit. Oh, some more light in here. As the sun beats down on us on a Monday morning, let me just fix it one more time. There we go. Now you can see me a little bit. Happy Monday for everybody. See you like you're with me in my office. We're like fixing and adjusting together. It's great. Great to be with you again. Hope everyone's gonna have an incredible week. Whenever you listen to this, happy whatever day it is. Uh, and today's an incredible day because it's a chance to get a little bit better than we were yesterday. Today's a special class it's dedicated uh, for the Elias Neshama, for the uplifting of the soul of Yedidya Moshe ben Elizim Chaim. It's also dedicated to the Torah, to the Torah thoughts and in merit of uh, the Women of El 2020 group. There's this incredible group of women. They're called Psalm Sisters. They get together the whole 40 days from this month all the way to Yom Kippur to do good deeds, to pray. Um, I had the opportunity to say all of their names before the show, and it was I was touched just by going down the list of how many people are part of this group. So it's in merit of these women that may you have an incredible year, incredible time, month now, incredible year, and may this be... Um, this, this period of time, high holidays, be one that gives you um, a life that you could never even dream for the better. May all your feelings be answered. We've been talking a lot about, about empowerment, about the rec recognizing that in order for us to be successful in life, we have to be able to see happiness and empowerment as a prerequisite to success. When life throws us challenges, it's not really the challenge that is getting to us. It's really the, the mental aspects of the challenge. Yesterday, we spoke about this concept of separating out our minds and our bodies. By just changing how we see the challenge in front of us, it changes how we deal with that challenge. And the story I told yesterday about the trainer who said, you're not suffering, you're strengthening, immediately changed my mindset from the physical pain being equated to, this, to the mental pain, disempowering me, making me feel like this was worthless, making me feel like I should be avoiding the pain. That's really what this is. When you feel that the pain is valueless, you want to avoid it. And when you want to avoid it, your brain checks out. So now your brain's not going to go down to its stores and pull up any level of, of strength to deal with something that's worthless, right? When you engage in something that's worth it, you'll engage in it. When you engage in something that's not worth it, you won't. This is a conversation I had the other day. Um, maybe it feels like the other day, but it was probably like weeks by now about a father who was, uh, he was disappointed that his child was not putting in the effort for, for spirituality. And I said, what do, you, what do you want from the kid? We live in a society where we value money. This country values materialism. You see it every second of every day. People are being honored because they are wealthy. How many times have you, forget local micro societies. I'm talking about just society in general. When's the last time you saw someone like on a big, huge screen in Times Square because he valued spirituality? Even, forget religion. There was a time once there was a guy named Billy Graham. I don't know if you guys remember Billy Graham. I was too young for Billy Graham, but I, when I was a kid, I remember just to watch some of the things. People would flock by the thousands. So there are places like that in the country. If you're living in the East Coast, Northeast, West Coast, you see people flocking to Madison Square Garden to hear a guy get up there and speak about God. Forget the religion that you're in. You see that? Well, they're flocking to watch ball. They're flocking to, to watch a concert. They're not flocking to people that are trying to make us more sensitive to God. They're flocking to people that are showing them that their bodies and their, mind, their, their money, that's what's... So it's not, it's not a question of the kid's capacity to be spiritual, I told the father. It's that he sees money and success as a worthy goal. So when he encounters the challenge of money, the, the challenge of physical success, he places his physical challenge separate from the mental challenge. He sees it as, okay, that's fine, but men mentally, he's still all in. Mentally, he doesn't see it as a challenge. Mentally, he sees it as part of the process, and the, the goal is so worth, worth it for him. So he musters up the power to overcome the challenge in front of him. But when you talk about a spiritual goal, especially for a uh, you know, this guy, I don't know, he's young, late, tw young 20s. 
living in a, in a world that doesn't really provide him much in terms of the role models of spiritual success? What, is he, what do you expect from him? It's not that he can't sit and study. It's not like he can't go pray. It's not like he can't pull money out of his pocket and give charity. He could do all those things. It's that, what's the point? And so when he encounters a spiritual challenge, he's sucked underneath it. It's, he doesn't see a value in the challenge. That's the difference. The difference is whether or not you see value in the challenge in front of you, because once you do, you separate out what the physical pain is and the mind doesn't descend into that, that level of pain because the mind accepts it as part of the process. Now, here's where it gets complicated. When we think that we're in control of life, then we sort of have a sense of what is or isn't valuable pain. But the minute we recognize that we're not controlling our lives, there's a greater, higher power than us. For those of you who watch the Shabbat show, 5.30 every Friday, we had a great person on this week. You can go to the Shabbat show.com and watch the, the, um, the repeat if you want. We interviewed a guy named Dr. David Pelkovitz, one of the most celebrated uh, psychiatrists, psychologists in our community. And he was awesome. It was, I don't know, somewhere, the show started at 5.30. He probably came on 5.40 if you want to go check it out. We spoke about a lot of these concepts of the feelings of stress and being overwhelmed and the concept of pain. And, we're, and I asked him, what does pain have to do with faith? And he said, according to all the research that he's seen, faith has a major piece to your ability to go through the stress that's in front of you. When you go through your life and you think that you're in control, then we think we know what's valuable and not valuable pain. And as a result, as soon as it comes at us, we're judging it. And as soon as you judge it, your brain will decide how much effort it's going to put into it. As soon as you judge, as soon as you judge the value of what you're going through, because if we know, as if we can see the future, as if we have any idea, when you judge it to not being valuable, immediately you put yourself in a disempowered space to not be able to access what you need to succeed. I'm going through this right now. I hope the world gets back to normal. It looks like it, but who knows? So as we get back to normal and, and everything goes back a little bit, I'm having, I'm finding moments of going back to the quarantine moments in my head. I'm thinking about March and some of the, sweetest moments I've had in March and April. Some of the sweetest moments we had with family and, and, and just the things that, I'm not talking about the pain and the fear and that stuff. I'm talking about just the moments of, of quiet, the moments of, of just being together with people. And, and I'm thinking back then, I don't know if I appreciated it as much. And I knew I wouldn't appreciate it, but now I'm feeling it. I was judging it. We're all judging it. We were judging it. It disrupted our lives. And it happens all the time in life. When you go through something, when you're going through it, you judge it and you go, well, it's not going to be great. I wish it was like this. I wish my kids were more like this. I wish I was here. I wish I was there. I wish I was married. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. I wish I had more money. I wish I was in a different neighborhood. Like, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And as soon as you get through it, you look back and like, wait, why did I judge it? Because when I judged it, I put myself in a more disempowered stance. Had I just walked into that challenge empowered, even if I was trying to change it, but empowered, it would have been so much better. Judging the pain, the challenge that is in front of you is actually putting you in a worse space. When I mean judging, I don't mean like, how do I do get better? I mean, s establishing value and saying this pain is worth it and this pain isn't. I'm also not saying like proactive pain, right? There's pains we just bring upon ourselves, right? I remember one time someone said to me that their kids were having like, they're having a hard time going to school because they stayed up at night watching, you know, these scary movies. And then they went out to the world and thought that they were true. I'm like, well, I got this amazing, like, I got this like great idea. But like, what is it? I'm like, why don't you like, get your kids to stop watching the movies. Well, it's so hard. I'm like, yeah, why don't you be their parents? Your kids are little. Like there's some things we bring upon ourselves. Like we have like those negative people in our lives that we just seem to always go back to. And they just 
pour negativity on us. So sometimes some things we bring upon ourselves. I saw a quote once saying like, the stomach you have now is the food you ate a decade ago. I thought that was great. Like don't fetch that you're having a hard time walking up the steps if you didn't shut your mouth for 10 years. You know what I'm saying? Like you could pass on dessert once or twice. Nothing's gonna happen if you pass on dessert. But don't eat indiscriminately for like during your 40s and then fetch it. You can't walk up the steps during your 50s. There's stuff you bring upon yourself, but let's move that out. There's stuff that comes at us. And when we judge it, good pain, bad pain, good things, bad things, we ruin it. Because we don't know what brings us good and brings us bad. Now, I don't want in any way to equate good being sickness. I don't want to get there. But I want to read you a quote. Irving Yalom. I said I would do that. I know Rebecca knows that. I know Rebecca was, I think it was Rebecca. It was Orita Rebecca who reminded me. It's from the book. I don't know if you see it or not. Page 109 if you have the book. Irving Yalom. Orion alone wrote regarding he was a psychologist or a psychiatrist for terminally ill cancer patients. Here's what he wrote. Listen to this. I'm checking my time. An open confrontation with death allows many patients to move into a mode of existence that is richer than one they expe experienced prior to their illness. I'm not judging things to be good or bad. Trust me when I tell you this. I'm just telling you what I'm reading. Research done by a man named Irving Yalom. Yalom on people that have cancer. Their mode of existence is richer than before the illness. Many patients report dramatic shifts in life perspective. They're able to trivialize the trivial, to assume a sense of control, to stop doing things that they don't wish to do, to communicate more open with, openly with family and friends, to live entirely in the present rather than the future and the past. Over and over we hear our patients saying, why did we have to wait until now till we're riddled with cancer to learn how to value and appreciate lives? Listen to what Professor Talbin Shachar says on this. Following the, the, the news of their terminal disease, they were still the same people with the same knowledge and life's questions and answers, the same cognitive and emotional capacities, yet their lives changed. They gained no new knowledge, rather an acute awareness of what they knew all along. In other words, they had it within them, the knowledge of how they should live life. But they ignored this knowledge as if like they were as it was if before they ignored or were unconscious of this. What Irving Yalom is saying is this challenge that was brought in front of them, for some of these people, they were able to stare at this challenge and recognize the challenge brought a certain measure of quality of existence that they never had before. It gave them focus gave them purpose, it allowed them to trivialize the trivial, it allowed them to have richer life experiences. In his research, I saw him quote that for some people, I don't think for everybody clearly, when asked if, when they recovered from their sickness, when asked if they would go through it again, many of them reported they would. Somehow this challenge, in this case, it was a massive challenge, but somehow this challenge seemed to give them a, a life that they never were able to get without. I want to extrapolate that here. We don't know why we go through stuff from the smallest little thing to God forbid worse. And we should never go through real challenge. I mean that. We should be able to learn lessons of depth without ever being challenged in a serious way. We should never know pain at a real level. But what we should be doing is recognizing that when I'm deal when I'm dealt with when I'm dealt with small little inconveniences. Oh wow. Someone so I'm not gonna say who it is because it was private to me. Someone just right now as I'm talking texted this to me. I'm not gonna say because it, it was done privately to me, that his mother is in hospice for cancer and this has literally happened to her. Amazing. When we start to see every second of our lives like this, why do we need to be shaken to our core? Why do we need to always look back and go, oh, right. There were little I wish I did. When I was young, I ever have this feeling when I was young, I wish. 
close friend of mine is a partner in a big law firm. He said to me, if I was asking him once, what advice would you give first year associates? Law firms are very difficult economic environment, uh, work environments. It seems like everyone in law firms have a great life. They pay you a lot of money. For those of you who are big firm lawyers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is torture for 90% of the people. They treat you like garbage. Not every place, but whatever. Maybe it's different now. And a lot of people get in there. If you're not like, if you don't love what you do, you're out. And it's just lots of torturous years. It doesn't seem like it's a lot of torture to the outside, but if you're in there, it is. Not real torture, but you know. And he said to me once, he said, if you can tell people anything, just say, while you're here, just be all in. Because when you resist it, you don't get the benefit of it. And if you're here for two to three years, for four to five years, the experience you can get can change your entire, entire life. When we go through frustrations, when we go through challenges, when we go through inconveniences, forget the big stuff, just the life. Why do we have to like resist it all the time and judge it all the time? Why can't we just feel it? Just accept it. Just let it come in without having us judge it as I wish I would have. I can't believe I didn't. Why me? Why now? Why me? Why now? Just accept it and recognize that I don't yet know the value of this thing, but I will. I know I will. And it's going to make me a richer person. It's going to make me a stronger person. It's going to make me a more sensitive person. I'm going to now develop a sensitivity to something I never did before. I'm going to now learn something. This happened to me more than once in my life, somehow with my car, where I got something, whether, whether a flat tire, something happened. It happened to me more than once, where some inconvenience with my vehicle happened. And I was annoyed, only to realize that when I was on a much more important trip further away from my house, I was prepared for the thing that I learned around the block. This happened to me many times in my life, thinking about it, like when I'm on a plane and something happened when I was on the way back that I learned what to protect against or do or not do to make a mistake when I had to go somewhere. When you're on the way back and you make a mistake where you go to the wrong place, you catch the, the flight, you're on your way home. When you're going somewhere, you got to make sure you're tied with your time. So many things I'm sure happened in our lives where when you go through the inconvenience, you learn something that later in life proves to you to be more valuable than when you learned it. So many times in life, God is giving us opportunities to grow and learn from experiences to prepare us for the challenges that are so much greater at, at, in, in the future. Yet we don't appreciate them when we're going through them. So we don't l learn from them fully. We're too busy resisting. We're not empowered. We're not excited. We're, we're judging it. When you go into this world and you let go of the control, you take what's in front of you with a certain vigor and you become more successful at that thing, you learn more from life than you would have otherwise needed to learn. You get it quicker. I don't know. I'm not God. Maybe that's, that helps get the thing you want earlier because you're ready prepped for it. I don't know. But at least it makes us more successful in the moment. And there's nothing more we can ask for than being more successful in the moment. That's all God wants. Let's get a little bit better every day. This whole period of time now, this high holiday period, really what we're really doing is we're trying to tap into a certain way of looking at the world. It's called, in Hebrew, it's called Bina, Bina. Lahavin in Hebrew means to understand, but really means to understand something from something. It's not just to understand for the first time, it's to look back at our lives and look at the things that we had to face or that we were successful in and try to create some new path that inc incorporates all the mistakes. That's why it says that people that fail, they can be even more successful than those that never do. It makes life much more exciting because there's nothing that is valueless. Even our greatest failures are instructions for the future. But we're going to continue tomorrow. Hopefully we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a giver and how you can tap into that. For the, for the ladies that are part of today's sponsorship, God should bless you. You should learn from everything you're doing. 
whether good or bad, how to get bigger and better, how to be more elevated. And for all of us, if we just for today stopped judging what we're going through and just walk into it with an empowered state, let the emotions come on you. Don't fight them. And just respond with empowerment, knowing in your heart that I may not know why this is happening, but I will one day. And we can be sure that today will be a stronger day than the past. That's all we can ask for, really. A stronger day than the past. And then you compound that, and we wake up one morning and we're different human beings. And by the way, nothing even really changed. We're just different because we learned how to engage in our lives better. All right, we'll continue this. Thanks so much for the sponsorships. You did your Moshe, and Elisa Chaim, Shev, and Elisa Neshama. We should only be strong, go stronger and stronger. Have an incredible day with God's help. I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Have a great day.